Okay, so this is the title. <laughs> I forgot. So um, we're going to be looking at the Flox family at four different taxonomic scales. So Ali just talked all about change at the decadal scale or century scale. So we'll be talking about change in a much deeper time in terms of millions of years, or tens, of, tens and hundreds of millions of years. Okay, so obviously this is a, a plant systematist. And so, you know, I mean, system, system, plant systematics has always relied on data from multiple fields of study. So we have um, geography, the kind of the distribution of organisms, we have morphology, from, uh, and we can get the geographic, geographic data from herbarium specimens or from field observation data. Morphology, which we can get again from field observations or herbarium specimens, that's at least very traditional plant systematics and rely heavily on herbarium specimens. We also have a wealth now of, or we have a wealth of ecological data that other researchers in not unrelated uh, fields to plant systematics have accumulated over the years. So we have, um, Ali talked about functional traits. We have all that data that we can integrate into plant systematics as well. And then of course we have phylogeny. So over the last 30 years we've accumulated all this DNA data in GenBank and other repositories. And so the question is, and now that we have all these different sources of data, what do we do with this data? And so all four of my chapters of my dissertation are trying to integrate all these sources, or all or at least a subset of these sources of data into one um, package, okay? So I promised four different taxonomic scales, so this should be the kind of the the name hierarchical classification that everyone should be familiar with, at least from introductory biology. This is the kind of weird um, Wikipedia version of this hierarchical classification, <laughs> the red fox, and um, kind of championed by Carlos Linnaeus. This is my classification, <laughs> championed by Ken Linnaeus. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about things at the ordinal level, so the order of the family level, family polymoniaceae, the genus level, genus polymonium, and the species level, kind of species of polymonium, and then as Ken mentioned, the population genetics of one endangered um, taxon. Okay? So I said um, kind of a little more formally, so I'm going to re-examine uh, evolutionary relationships in the order of Arachelis. In a time category hypothesis that we can use to examine speciation and um, historical biogeography. Second chapter, I'm going to test the hypothesis that changes in floral form in the family Polymoniaceae, our response to selection, natural selection by pollinators. Third chapter, examine the contribution of particulate evolution to the evolutionary history of the genus Polymonium. Um, this chapter, I didn't look at geographic speciation, but if you were at the biology colloquium earlier this semester, I talked about that, so I'm not going to talk about that today. But I will talk about vegetative evolution in the genus. And then the last um, chapter, I'm going to examine the genetic and ecological history of Polonia occidentale, which is endemic, or the subspecies that's endemic to Minnesota and Wisconsin. Okay, so starting out with the Ericale. So the Ericale should be familiar to you, especially as a fruit, uh, from at least some of the fruits. We have kiwi fruit, um, Brazil nuts, blueberries, of course, and then persimmon. And it's apparently also artistically <laughs> interesting. So we have a pitcher plant here in the middle, um, so Ceraceniaceae, but it's also apparently some, there are actually some other families and people here in the body department of study. So two orchids on the left, the um, cotton family, and then the jack of the pulpit family. <laughs> in terms of floral diversity in the air families, there's a lot of floral diversity. This is just a small sampling. What we have, so we have rhododendron, the ericaceae, um, we have the, actually the flower pitcher plant, which is kind of weird, it's pendant, um, flowers of um, persimmon, and then touch me not in the upper left, and then actually T here at um, number, or letter I. And the past history, or the past kind of hypothesis about the phylogenetic relationships in the order has been fairly unresolved. So in the kind of the, this is from uh, Jörg Schoenberger, former postdoc at Ken's, published in 2005, this is the most recent 
um, order-wide phylogeny. Well, the Roman numerals kind of indicate um, most, uh, so most of the families are well supported, and there are, only, there are a few major clades that are well supported that are indicated by the Roman numerals up there. But the important thing here is that the backbone relationships of the order are, are very unresolved. And this has been thought to kind of have been a result of a rapid um, early radiation. There are a few groups of angiosperms that have this, the uh, Malpigiales, which contains the Spurge family, um, and the Caryophyllales, absolutely the placement of the um, Caryophyllales, the kind of pink, the group of, uh, that includes pinks incarnations. But one thing that this 2005 study didn't include was the placement of this parasitic plant, uh, Mitrostema. This is a, only two species. There's one in East Asia and there's one in Central America. It's parasitic on the, on the roots of oaks. It kind of has a weird floral biology and a bunch of stamens that are actually fused into a ring around the female reproductive parts. It sheds its pollen and then the staminal kind of column or ring falls off and then the female parts are receptive to pollen. So these are all actually pre-shedding pollen. But we did know as early as 2004 that Mitrostemon was in Ericaeulae. So here it's sisters of blueberries. This is based on one mitochondrial marker. But you can see there are only three um, Ericaeulae in this tree, so it's kind of unclear where um, Mitrostemon actually fell. So we have sequences for about a third of the family for 25 gene regions. We calibrated that with 25 fossils. And then, as I mentioned, to use that to look at the historical biogeography and diversification of the order. And if you're more interested in this more than what I'm talking about today, this was published earlier this year. Okay, so this is a reduced um, phylogeny order, just showing kind of some exemplars of the families. Of the colors more or less correspond to families. It's not that important. Up here in the dark blue is the family Ericaceae, the blueberry family. But Mitrostemonaceae, the parasitic plant, falls here. Well, that's sister to the Brazil nut family. It's about, um, and you can see that this is this is the dated phylogeny too. So you can see that the in the backbone of the order is very old. It's about 110 million years, and most of the major clades are formed by 100 million years. In terms of historical biogeography, so this is math. The pies here are colored according to these regions. So here at the root of the family, um, this is the first that originated in um, Indo-Malaysia, the Neotropics, or in the shared area of the Indo-Malaysia and Neotropics, which is kind of surprising given that even 110 million years ago, these two areas were very wide, or very geographically separated. But you can see, based on kind of this um, pink color, red color, and blue color, that there's a lot of shifting between into Malaysia and the Neotropics in the early history of the Arabians. And especially up here, as you can see, this is the blueberry clay, larger clay of the blueberry family up here, kind of and is inferred to have originated in the shared Neoarctic, so North America plus Indo Malaysian area. So there's been a boreotropical hypothesis has been proposed for a lot of these groups, um, stating that it uh, came from East Asia over Beringia into North America. And that may at least support some of those ideas of historical connections between those two land masses. So this is the entire tree of 4,500 species. I'm not, obviously, I removed the tip label so you can't see them. But this is colored um, based on rate of speciation. So darker or uh, cooler colors are fewer species generated per million years. And then the warmer colors are more species being <coughs> per million years. So you can see that there are a lot of changes in the range of species formation. So example, this is that example in here, I believe this is um, in rhododendron. And then here in the South African ericas, for example. So in all, um, if you were to look at statistically significant shifts, there are about 70 in this whole tree. And What's more, all, most of these shifts are very recent. So, you know, the order is 110 million years ago, but most of these shifts in the rate of species formation are happening in the last 30 million years, and especially in the last 15 to 20 million years. 
So the order is old, but most of the species are very, or most of the clades are very young. I'm going to point out a few of the more salient shifts in speciation rates. So we have a species that you might be familiar with, say the shift in speciation rate in the kiwi fruit, Actinidaceae, in touch me nots, in Arctostaphylos, um, the manzesias, which are a big group of about 100 species in California. They're only about 2 million years old. Um, Erica in South Africa, Rhododendron in East Asia, the South American blueberries, which are a large group in the Andes. I have to mention the phlox family here, so we'll be talking about that later, but Pulmonium is one shift in the increase in speciation rate. Um, primroses, pitcher plants, and tea all have increases in speciation rate as well. Okay, so just in summary for the first chapter, the backbone relationship to the Ericales we make, even though have some made some progress, they still remain unclear. The parasitic plant, um, Interstemonaceae, is sister to the Brazil nut family. Ericales is an old group, about 110 million years ago, that origin in Indo-Malaysia, and most of the increases in speciation rate have been recent. Okay, so moving on to the second chapter, kind of looking at floral evolution and the phlox family as a whole. And so the central idea here is the idea of adaptive radiation. So that's essentially the, um, that uh, species have, um, or that species have formed in, in, um, in response to ecological niche space. So the changes in morphology associated with the ecological opportunity. So a classic example of Darwin's finches, where beak size is related to the food that they eat. The Hawaiian finches, again, with beak size, or beak bill size is related to the food that they eat. We have these elongated curved bills for nectar. We still have smaller bills for eating seeds. And then the cichlid fishes in the, in the lakes in East Africa, where we have um, diversification along a um, uh, gradient in the, uh, in the different benthic zones within the, within the lake. Okay. In North America, this is a well-cited example, the columbines, um, where it's been hypothesized that there are changes in the spur length. So these are nectar, these are spurs filled with nectar that pollinators have selected for increased spur length. So we have shifts from bee to hummingbird and then to hawk moth pollination. This is a well-cited example, but if you notice, there are only a few shifts to, for example, hawk moth pollination. So we have maybe three or four shifts, so it's not very statistically robust. I would argue that a more statistically robust example would be a larger group with more change in the floral form, which I would say would be Pulmoniaceae. So this is a just a snippet of kind of some of the floral diversity in Pulmoniaceae. So we have pollination by long tongued flies, um, hummingbirds, bats, um, bees. We even have self pollinating in some cases. And ideas are in this kind of all these floral um, differences of floral form combined with some ideas about relationships based on morphology kind of led to this kind of idea of pollinator transition. So how do we get from bee to moth pollination, for example? So um, this was first proposed by Vernon in 1965, and it's been modified. This is from a book by Stebbins. But we basically have all these pollination systems coming from a bee pollinated ancestor with little transitions between pollinator types. You do have, for example, moth to hummingbird here. But they basically all come from bee. But one thing that we didn't know at that point was that Pulmoniaceae is sister to the Ocotillo family, Pulcariaceae, which is mostly hummingbird pollinated. So one question is how does our new knowledge about relationships based on molecular data combined with knowledge of outgroups change our interpretation of the evolution of pollination systems. And here's just the evidence showing that these are bat pollinated. This is one of the bat pollinated cobayas. This is the only group of bat pollinated species in Ecuador. So for this, we got sequences from 23 regions for 488 taxa. Um, we had 28 quantitative and qualitative floral traits, pollinator data based on field observations. And using these data, we did an ancestral state reconstruction of pollinator type, um, tested the association of these quantitative traits with pollinators, looked for shifts along the, in trait values along the phylogeny, 
And then ask, ask at least in a cursory way, like right now, are the, if these shifts in pollinators are associated with shifts in trees. So this is our phylogenetic context. These are color coded by clay. Um, don't think you'll, you won't really see these colors again. But just to show kind of the context here, so we have hummingbird pollinated plants here, we have the bat pollinated plants down here. This will be important later. Pull one of those all the way up here. This is about 11 million years old. In terms of overlap of our three data sets, remember we have pollination, pollinator data, morphological data, and phylogenetic data. This is just the overlap of our data sets. What we most are most interested in is we have phylogenetic, the phylogenetic context. So we have 207 species that are overlapping in all three trait or all three categories. We have about 380 that overlap between our morphological data set and our phylogenetic data set. We have about 220 species where we have pollinator data for it. This ancestral state reconstruction of pollinator type is more or less colored by. Um, this is the, so the colors correspond to pollination. You'll see this again. So you can see hummingbird pollination originating multiple times here, 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 here. Um, bee pollination. So the ancestor was bee pollinated. You can see that translates to a lot of the backbone nodes. Um, and here actually is the hummingbird pollinated from query. You can see that that is actually ancestrally bee pollinated as well. These are two species sister to the rest of the genus that are bee pollinated. And we have up here in the orange actually self pollination systems. So it's a little ambiguous out there as to what the pollinator was, whether it was long time fly or selfing, but there is a possibility that a large number of species were selfing and then reverted to outcrossing. Okay, so just remember a reminder that this is our hypothesis about the transition between pollination systems based on morpho morphological data or morphological inference of phylogeny. And this is the transition. Uh, this is kind of a transition between pollinator types that we have based on a, a inference based on molecular data. So you can see that B actually does not give rise to all pollination systems, although it does give rise to a large number. We do have B going to bat here. But to get to hawk moth, or you can't go, from, for example, from hawk moth to B. So you have to go through another, another pollination system to get to hawk moth. So that sums up the pollinator data, but we also have our quantitative traits. So one thing I'm going to say before I go into some of the quantitative traits is that we scored pollinator or corolla shape, and we did that. Um, we had so we have outlines of all the corollas, and we transformed that into a quantitative variable using Fourier transformations. So essentially, what you do is have all these outlines, fit trigonometric functions to them, and you get kind of this and do a principal components analysis to reduce the dimensionality of the data. And so essentially what you get is that the first principal component, which by definition explains most of the variation of the data set, explains tubular to broad corollas, or to tubular to companionate corollas. And that has about 72% of the variation in the data set. So these are colored by clay. You can see the distribution of these corolla shapes. You can see again, uh, tubular to broad corollas, a lot of very tubular corollas, not so many broad corollas, but there is some clustering in terms of clays in this morpho space. Okay, taking all um, 13 of our traits and doing a principal components analysis on them to reduce the dimensionality of the data, we get this scatter. These are all colored by pollinator type. We have bats up in the upper right hand corner, for example. So you can see there is some separation based on pollinator types, but there is also a lot of overlap based on our different pollinator types. Especially, perhaps not surprising, our two different lepidoptera groups, butterfly, diurnal, and then our nocturnal moth and hawk moth pollination are all more or less overlapping in this ordination space. If we were to overlay our phylogenetic tree onto this, Kind of basically just put it on top and twist, <laughs> twist around the edges to try to connect close relatives. I know it's a little confusing, <laughs> but 
Um, essentially, the, the important part is this yellow dot here in the middle. So you could, well, you can see there's a lot of unrelated species that are very close to each other in kind of morphology. But this yellow dot in the middle is the most recent common ancestor of the family. And it appears, it's kind of smack dab in the middle between bee and hummingbird pollinated species. Kind of that is at least some more evidence that the ancestor of Pulmoniaceae may have been bee pollinated. Okay, so how do these traits vary between our different pollinator groups? So you can do an ANOVA analysis controlling for phylogeny. And so you can see that this is just the number of comparisons, there are 36 possible pairwise comparisons. But more important is the percent significance. So you can see, especially length measurements of Corolla 2 length, 30, 40, about 40 to 30. Or 40% of those comparisons are significantly different. So Corolla 2 went another one, and then even Corolla lobes, so kind of the landing platforms that pollinators see, are significantly different. And even you know, some of the, I mean, in this case, the Andresians or the male parts are fused to the Corolla, so there is possibly some correlation, but the, even the male parts are significantly different. The length of the male parts are significantly different between pollinator groups. Okay, and then where are we finding, well, at least how many shifts are we finding in these trait values? Statistically significant shifts in these trait values are we finding in the phylogeny. So that tends to vary between traits. You have anywhere between 20 shifts, for example, in tube shape, uh, nine shifts in coral length, um, but in some other ones we have very few shifts. So coral and lobe lengths only sh shifts in one clade. Now, I'm not going to show you where, for each trait where these shifts occur, but I will show you a summary of where these shifts are occurring. So, these edge, so for all of our 11 continuous traits, these are marking the edges on the phylogeny where these shifts are occurring. So the, more, the higher the number, obviously, the more shifts are happening on that edge. You can see up here with these tropical species, for example, in the upper left, they are all very large corolla, so hummingbird and bat pollinated. We do have a shift up there, of actually six traits shift up there. We have three traits shifting down here, for example. But they're more or less scattered throughout the phylogeny, so we don't see, for example, all 11 traits shifting on a, on a particular edge of the tree. And moreover, these shifts don't appear to be correlated with the shifts that I just showed you. Well, not all of them appear to be correlated with the shifts I just showed you in pollinator type. So for example, up here, but where the number six is actually infer no shift in pollinators, so going from B to B, essentially. So what does that mean? So that might mean that we're having shifts within pollinator groups, so for example, small bees to large bees, for example. Okay, just in conclusion, the most recent common ancestor of pollinators would be pollinated. If you have groups that differ between groups of pollinators, but there is a lot of overlap. It appears that there's more gradual, even though we have uh, correlation between pollinators and um, morphology, it appears there are more gradual than punctuated shifts in these traits that are also mismatched from shifts in pollinators. So one possibility is it could be multiple selective pressures. So you have pollinators so maybe selecting for higher nectar content in the flowers or longer flowers, but then you have uh, more abiotic factors such as um, precipitation that is selecting against um, kind of water loss from larger flowers or more use or investing more sugars in nectar. Okay? And so as I mentioned, there may be shifts that we didn't detect within pollinator groups, so large bees to small bees, for example. Okay, moving on to the third chapter, looking specifically at polemonium. So polemonium is most diverse in Western North America, where we have a lot of climatic and or topographic and climatic heterogeneity, so going from deserts to alpine peaks. As I mentioned, are a lot of the genera that are alpine in Western North America are recent in origin, so less than 10 million years. And kind of speciation is thought to have been facilitated by climatic drying, mountain range building, and glaciation that basically essentially leads to allopatric speciation. So there are some large alpine radiations in Western North America, so the Indian paintbrushes, uh, penstemon, which is actually illustrated here. So those have given about over 100 species, but there are all some, also some smaller radiations that have given on the order of 50 species. 
which are still significant of species, especially significant number of species, especially considering that they're very recent in origin, the groups are very recent in origin. Specifically with Polmoni, our case study here, about 20 to 40 species, so there's a lot of taxonomic uncertainty. Most of, them is, most of that uncertainty is about Eurasian populations, which have been understudied. They're all very close, clearly very closely related. Um, but there is, as I mentioned, an increased speciation rate in the context of the broader Arachelaes. Polomoni is only 10 million years old, and it is mostly bee pollinated, if you remember from chapter 2. So it's a distribution, but there's a bias, and it does, it's much more widespread in Russia, but there's just a bias, lack of collections in that area. And this is the floral diversity, fairly similar, all blue pollinated, well, blue flowers. Um, what we do on the upper right, or upper left, have a hummingbird pollinated species, and then here's an annual species, or annual cell pollinating species. Uh, the kind of similarity in floral form is further emphasized here. These are all to scale, more or less the same size. We do have the hummingbird and hawk moth pollinated ones over here. But most of the species diversity is kind of this general companionly blue flower. What I consider to be more intriguing is the vegetative diversity in polemonium. So these are um, pinnately compound leaves. They, and they kind of vary in terms of the shape of the leaflet. So you can see here more rounded leaflet with an accumulate tip, um, more very circular leaflets up here. And then on the top, we have actually species that have twice compound leaflets. So these have been described as verticillate in the, in the literature. Um, so they're also very small leaflets. And these have all been found at high elevation. They're, uh, most of these species occur um, at, as, uh, on rocks and in higher elevations than these distichous uh, once compound leaflets. Okay. In terms of our past, knowledge about phylogenetic relationships in polemonium. It's essentially we just know that species are monophyletic, but we don't know how the species are related. Okay, so I wanted to address better what the evolutionary history of polemonium is using 360 nuclear loci. Specific, there are multiple causes of gene tree discordance. I'm testing between two here. So we have um, Incomplete lineage sorting, where by random chance gene copies have a different history than the species. Or we can have, in this case, migration, where we can have particular evolution where unrelated lineages exchange genes. So test between those and also look at this according to the chloroplast tree and the nuclear ribosomal tree. Those are two very commonly used markers in plant systematics. And then, like I mentioned, briefly look at vegetative evolution. So ask if small and twice compound leaflets are correlated to high altitudes. So the reasoning behind that is that, these smoke, that in higher altitudes you have less available nitrogen. You also have less moisture because of cold um, climates. And, uh, well, at least less available moisture because of cold climates um, with evapotranspiration. And so these small leaflets might help keep the plant warm, might reduce water loss, um, et cetera. Might be more efficient than focus on the size. Okay. So this is this is a tree only accounting for incomplete lineage sorting. So one limitation is that well, that trees, even of this size, at least right now, computationally can't can't test explicitly for reticulate evolution. But these are all colored by clays, and you'll see these colors later. Um, essentially what we get is a, except for some cases, essentially what we get is a well-resolved, well-supported phylogeny of polymonium based on these 360 nuclear loci. But there is a lot of discordance between these loci. Actually explicitly testing for reticulate evolution on a subset of 17 species, again these are color-coded by our coalescent species tree, we do see that there is at least three um, instances of particular evolution in the history of polemonium. So these arrows indicate that we have movement of 33, or we have exchange of 33% of the genome from this undescribed species, which I'll talk about in a little bit, to this polemonium pauciflorum, 26% of the genome from this elusum lineage to carnium, 
and 47% of the genome from this pulcheromone clade to elegans. So this polygy is a little bit different, so obviously the green up here is not monophyletic, um, and the blue here is not monophyletic. In terms of our kind of more common, well, genealogies are more commonly used markers in systematics. This is the nuclear ribosomal DNA. You can see that more or less, we do are recovering um, similar clades at least. So, but the orange here is embedded in here, but it's not well supported. The blue is showing up in multiple places, but it's not well supported. And the um, orange is showing up in multiple places, but not well supported. One interesting well, support, well supported um, discordance here is this carnium embedded here in this elusive Nevadensi lineage. This Nevadensi here is sister to this dark purple lineage, whereas based on coalescent tree is up on the top, sister to the other species on the top of our biology. This is just uh, links connecting identical accessions between these two markers, so the coalescent on the right and the nuclear ribosomal on the, or off, the coalescent on the left and the nuclear ribosomal on the right, just showing this, especially with this light blue clade, given the discordance. Chloroplast is much messier, even though the tree is almost fully supported. You see blues popping up multiple places, orange pop, or yellow is popping up multiple places, green is popping up multiple places. And if you recall, this white blue lineage was embedded in the genus in the, based on the nuclear data, and now it's in the sister to the genus based on the chloroplast. And this matches up more or less very well with um, data, earlier data that I had from about, about 5,000 base pairs of the chloroplast based on Sanger sequencing. So it looks surprising, but it is not surprising based on what we knew previously. And this is just the amount of discordance is further illustrated by this kind of tangle gray. So one thing we want to ask is, can a complete lineage sorting explain the discordance between these two gene trees that I just showed you and the species tree? And to do that, we can simulate gene trees under a coalescent process given our nuclear species tree. And then we can compare the distribution of those expected gene trees to our observed um, distribution of our gene trees. So you can see here, this light blue is what we expect based on the nuclear ribosome part of this, actually some light green bars. <coughs> Where we, the gene trees we expect for the chloroplast, these red bars are the gene trees we expect for the nuclear genome. You can see that the, you know, the nuclear ribosomal genome is kind of in the lower tail of what we would expect for the nuclear genome. But the chloroplast is way out there in terms of the amount of discordance that we would expect. Okay. And then we do see some evidence for some of the hybridization that might be adding extra um, amounts of discordance in our nuclear ribosomal gene tree that I didn't point out earlier. Remember we had pulcherimum lineage and elegans lineage with a reticulation event. You see elegans here in nest and pulcherimum. And then we had exchange from pelusum and carnium, and we see here carnium nested in the pelusum plate. So we have two of our reticulation, two or three reticulation events show up in the nuclear ribosomal candidate. Okay. So this is just a summary of kind of the evolutionary history of polymonium, at least at this point, but based on our knowledge at this point, showing our three reticulate, reticulate um, reticulation events, and then these triangle bars correspond to the more or less to the species diversity based on accepted species. <coughs> so I can sample that much in the cerulean lineage, but there is a lot of very similar, very closely related species. So how can we explain this excess of discordance in the chloroplast genome? I propose that chromosomal rearrangements are responsible for that. So on the left here, we have the chromosomes of different um, species of polymonium that turn out to be very or distantly related. You can see the chromosomal shape is different. And then artificial hybrids here on this side between species. These are two closely related species. So you can see a lot of pairing. These are two distantly related species, but there's a lot of mismatches in homologous chromosomes. 
So how can we explain that then? So what we need to have to actually detect reticulation in our nuclear gene trees is we need to have crossing over between genes, or between nuclear gene, or nuclear chromosomes. And so if we have these chromosome look, um, rearrangements crossing over can't happen. So essentially what we have is hybridization between two species. We have possibly chloroplast capture with one of them. But this crossing over never happens. So we just have back crossing with one of the parental species, where we get chloroplast, potentially get chloroplast capture, but have no signal in the nuclear genome. Okay. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about in this chapter is the evolution of leaflet. So this is an ancestral state reconstruction of leaflet area with um, warmer colors being smaller area and dark and cooler colors being larger area. So you can see large uh, leaflet area in small multiple times here. This eastern clade and then up top in the foliosissimum group. These are box plots of leaflet length and leaflet width. And then these circles on the nodes are an ancestral state reconstruction of leaflet phyllotaxis. So if they're once compound or twice compound, you can see a single origin here of twice compound leaflet with subsequent loss in the, the folio system on group. The takeaway when we kind of test leaflet area, leaflet length, and leaflet width against the altitude in which these species are found is that these trait that, that these leaflet characters are not related to health. So there's something else at play here. There's a pretty wide latitudinal gradient in these species. So where so kind of species in more have higher latitudes, um, have um, similar ecological, an ecological niche to species at higher elevations at lower altitudes. So there could be not accounting for the latitudinal differences. Okay? So the conclusion articulation is important in full volume, but neither neither detected articulations nor complete lane story fully support the chloroplast discordance. And leaflet evolution is not directly related to altitude. Something I didn't talk about were some taxonomic implications. If you go back, yeah, so this, you can just see it here. In this case, there are two clades of pulmonium viscosum that are clearly not closely related. So we have viscosum here in the intermountain region, and then we have viscosum up here in the Rocky Mountain region. And so there's a lot of variation of pulmonium viscosum which this picture on the left doesn't do justice to. In the Rocky Mountain, we have very tubular corollas. And in the Intermountain region, we have very um, corollas with shorter tubes. So someone does need to do an kind of analysis of tube length across the geographic range to see if these um, differences in corolla morphology correspond to differences in, in genetic differences. And then on the right here, I mentioned there's a new species that is in, involved in some of gene exchange. This is in southern Arizona in the pulmonary poliosystem group. The group has a lot of synonyms associated with it, but apparently no one has put a name to this variant. This is very closely related to pulmonary flema, which has yellow flowers in central Arizona. And essentially, these, this clay is characterized by kind of acute corolla lobes. They're very flocose or woolly pubescence in the inflorescence. Okay, so the last chapter is looking at population genetic structure of endangered um, subspecies in Western North America, or from Western North America that is disjunct in the Great Lakes. Um, this is just an example of disjunct distribution, so where we have widely separated populations of a species. This is not the Great Lakes disjunct, this is Dutchman's Breaches, which is flowering now. So we found in Eastern North America, a lot of empty space in between, and then it pops up in Western North America. And apparently there's a YouTube video, which I haven't watched, but I didn't find this weird <laughs> title slide for it. I don't know what's going on there. Okay, so this is what pulmonium oxygen tally looks like. This is a wetland species in Western North America. Um, here is the type typical um, phase in Western North America, subspecies occidentale, has yellow anthers, it has these kind of broader, um, more rounded leaflets. 
And this is the substance of the custody here in Wisconsin and Minnesota. There's white anthers and much more linear leaflets. Although there is a range of variation in Western Occidentalian in terms of leaflet shape that approaches um, the lacustri. This is all part of a circumboreal sweet pulmonary cerulean species complex. So you just tilt it on its side so you're looking pull down, pull, pull down view. But here's Occidentalia, Western North America. It's pulmonary cuneiform in, in Beringia, it extends over into um, Siberia, it's actually more extensive than that. And then Polonium cerulean is more or less, that, that, is, that is strictly Eurasian. This publication that this figure came through or came from didn't treat Polonium cerulean with custody, but it would be in here. There are only five known populations of this thing. Here are all five. You can see on the upper right the kind of North American distribution again with the cuneiform in red, Occidentalian blue, and then Lacustrian in green. These populations are all color coded, and they'll be similar colors throughout the rest of this chapter. You can see um, all more or less northern Minnesota, southern, more southern Minnesota, and then all the way over here in Florence County. Of isolated. People thought that this might be, have been introduced from out west early on just because of, kind of the very patchy distribution and also because it likes disturbed habitats. But it turns out it isn't. Okay, so I have 93 samples of the custody from all, all five populations, and then two outgroups, so an outgroup of uh, cutiform and one of Occidentale, and about 70,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms from genotyping by sequencing. So if you don't know what that is, basically you digest the DNA with a restriction enzyme, attach um, DNA barcodes to it so you know what sample that came from, pull everything together, sequence it all, and then pull out the individual reads and create a uh, loci with those. It also looked at nucleotide diversity, um, uh, fixation index, and Tejima's D, which looks at the um, test for um, deviations from uh, neutral evolution in the sequence, and then looked at admixture using the program structure. Okay. We also had some ecological niche modeling, which you should be familiar, should, should be familiar with from uh, Allie's talk. So look, actually, she was projecting into the future, I'm projecting into the past. So kind of take distribution points, take ecological variables, create a distribution model from that, and they can kind of project the probability of occurrence based on a different climatic layer. So we only had two or three grid cells for lacustri, so the species distribution model, the grid model is not going to be that accurate. So we did this with a close friend of well, relatives to ask if they could occupy Minnesota or Wisconsin during the last glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago or the last interglacial period about 130,000 years ago. Okay, so these are relationships between all five populations. So the Wisconsin population sister to all the Minnesota populations, and the two Minas northern Minnesota populations are each other's closest relatives. In the upper right, you just have, including the outgroups, we trimmed off the outgroups in the, in the circle tree in the middle. We have a cute form. Um, Based on our chapter three results, we have a cuneiform and a sister to Occidentale plus Occidentale lacustri. But you can see that there's a very long branch leading to Ox the lacustri group. Um, so these are genetic, very genetically different, at least from our outbreaks that we sampled. There's another principal components analysis, taking all our SNPs, doing data reduction on that. So based on our first principal component, we have this. Swan River population in southeastern Minnesota separating out from all our other populations. If we were to look at principal component two, we have the Spider Creek population again in south, southern Minnesota, southwestern Minnesota separating out from the remainder of the populations. I don't show it here, but principal component three separated out the Wisconsin population. And essentially these two northern Wisconsin Minnesota populations are very, very similar. Okay, this is population admixture using structure. We tested between three populations, so um, uh, corresponding to our taxonomic um, units, all the way up to 
seven populations corresponding to our actual geographic units. The best um, number of populations was six. This is the Wisconsin one here, so there are some admixed individuals from these other three populations here. The Swan River population in southeastern Minnesota is almost all fairly uniform, some admixture. Spider Creek, again, is fairly uniform. And then these two northern Minnesota populations are very similar. Again, okay. Serves us some genetic population genetic statistics. There's low nucleotide diversity, low observed heterozygosity. Related to that is the inbreeding coefficient, but that's also um, high. So about 91% of the individual or the variation is found within individuals. There's not that much population differenti differentiation between geographic populations. And there is evidence for a genetic bottleneck. So Tachuba's D was statistically negative. So that means there's an excess of rare alleles. So pop indicating possible <coughs> population expansion after uh, for a bottleneck. In terms of niche models, so the similar to what Ellie had. So the warm colors indicate high probability of occurrence. The cool colors indicate low probability of occurrence. I marked in circles the extant distribution or dis extant distributions of the species, and then in triangles the distributions of the clustery. So the top are for the last interglacial about 130,000 years ago. So you can see that Pulmonium cuneiform was more or less restricted to Beringia at that point, as it is today. And then Occidentalia is more kind of Cascade Sierra. So there's basically no probability of occurrence in Eastern North America. Going back to the last glacial maximum about 21,000 years ago, we have Pulmonium cuneiform more or less restricted to northern Beringia. There's a high probability here occurring in the southern, in the center, in the northern Rockies, but that was all ice at the time, so there's no way that that could actually occur there. <laughs> and again, there's some probability that Oxford cuneiform could have occurred in the Great Lakes region. So this area is what we're looking for in terms of the driftless area in terms of possible lakes or refugia for Occidentale. But there's a very low probability there. And then in the western Occidentale, more or less restricted to its current range um, in the last glacial maximum, essentially no, pro no probability of occurring in the driftless zone. Okay, so in conclusion, all our populations of Lacustre are very genetically similar, but they're also genetically distinct, especially in southern Minnesota. There's low genetic diversity, and there's some evidence for a population expansion after a genetic bottleneck. The closest relatives of Lacustre couldn't have occupied the upper Midwest during the last 100,000 years. In fact, I can talk about this, but in chapter three, the divergence between Pulmonium occidentale and Pulmonium lacustri is about two and a half million, they diverged about two and a half million years ago. So it's possible that Lacustri could be a, re a Pleistocene relic from a now extinct Western species, but it's un unclear at this point. So perhaps I'm not going to actually make this a defense this man. I'm not going to make a decision right here on whether or not Pulmonium Lacustri should be an endemic species to the Upper Midwest. Um, but that's a possibility based on the data. Okay. So overall. Um, fully resolving the ancient rapid radiation of Achilles is going to require some next generation sequencing approach where we have multiple nuclear loci. Um, well, in terms of Pulmonium C, floral traits are different between pollinators, but the differences aren't always clear cut. And floral form may be the result of selection by, from abiotic factors such as um, climate, climate, and also biotic factors such as, in this case, we're actually testing pollinators. Reticulation is important in Pulmonium, um, but it's his and, and its history also indicates that there could be widespread chloroplast capture without a signal in the nuclear genome. And finally, Pulmonium accidentally lacustri is morphologically, genetically, and ecologically distinct from its closest relatives. Okay, we'll have one acknowledging slide. Of course, my advisor, Ken, my committee, um, the whole site of the lab, um, some people at UW bought me that helped with um, kind of analytical stuff and just talking about, about things, and then family and friends. Okay? And then all my funding source, sources that I need to acknowledge. <laughs>